Well, hello, one and all. And a really big welcome to one and all, and especially those who are watching. I'm just, I'm so glad you're with us and part, part of us today. I love it. Well, for those who are regulars, like I said, welcome, welcome. Those who are visiting here, and sadly, Eliza, Eliza told me she's leaving on Tuesday. But that's sad, but we do hope you come back again. And as I said, you do. You're really welcome back here. So, and um, mind, and looking, look, uh, I just don't know if you know. Do anyone know here how much was raised for the youth ministry on their trivia night? Do you know or you don't know? So I know whether to say or not. You don't know. You don't know. $1,300. So there you go. So those who went, thank you very much. Those who donated, thank you very much. And praise God, $1,300. That's great, isn't it? So what uh, we have today, we have the offering is going to the local church ministry. We got the sing-along, which is at 5.30, and with daylight saving, that will change. But for this... This t today, it's still at the old time, and we're going to actually have Julie leading out with the singing, and Emma has the devotional. And then, on if you're an early riser, or you have a bit of insomniac, um, if you can't get to sleep, you've got the Sunday, you've got the dawn service at 6am. And I went last year for the first time, and I'm up at 5.30 anyway, so it's not too much of a problem for me. And I've really, really enjoyed it. The weather was a bit, but it looks like it's going to be great this time. So, like I said, if you're an early bird, come. I think you will really, really enjoy it. Then we have uh, next Sabbath, we have Ken uh, preaching because we're going to have communion. And I was just thinking, this is going to be my last time up here for a while too, last Saturday in this month. Whew. I don't know, but for me, time's just it's got roller skates on, I tell you. It's just whooping along. Well, anyway, I won't be here for a couple of months. Leonie is going to take over, and then it is Leonie, isn't it? <laughs> oh, good. I did get it right. And then Darlene. So for those who are watching, I really hope you're still watching in three months' time so I can welcome you again. And uh, let's see. Any, oh, then the Sabbath after that, we got Bob Saunders. And he'll be here for the month while um, Anders and Emma are away for the month. And we wish you God's safety travels on your time and that you really enjoy it and we'll be really glad too when you come back so and also i believe in the notification here someone's birthday over there probably wishes this wasn't happening but anyway it's happening <laughs> samuel i see here it's your birthday it's do tell us when it is and how old you be. Oh, okay. Didn't have to care, but anyway, since you are. Tomorrow. 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 And you're going to be the grand age of... Sweet 14. Can we all remember back when we were 14? <laughs> well, tradition goes it. We're going to sing happy birthday to you, Samuel, because it's tradition. Happy birthday to you Happy birthday to you extra days. I can have a few more parties. Don't have to go to work. Those who are chocoholics, oh, it gives me a great excuse to pig out on chocolate and it's okay. But for us in the
Christian world is really different. It's totally different. I want to encourage you that over this Easter period, I want you to, in your mind, storytell in your mind and envision you being an unseen watcher. And you're watching Christ go into Gethsemane. You see him struggling with the weight of our sin and despair. The drops of blood coming from him because the struggle is so intense. And then he goes ahead with it. Praise him because now we've got the blessed hope because he went through with it. He could have failed. Think about if he failed. Hard, awful thought, isn't it? Then think about his betrayal. Think about how he was whipped. His back was like raw meat. He was spat upon. His beard was pulled out. He was spit on. Then when he was on the cross, he was mocked and jeered, humiliated. But he did it for you, folks. He did it for me. He did it for all of us. Buried in the tomb. And then that grand time he came forward. That's why I got the blessed hope. So I really want to encourage you not to just think about it today or yesterday, but every day over this Easter period, it wouldn't hurt to even carry it on. Just really think about the enormity of the cost, how he suffered terribly, all because he's got your name on his nail prints and his hands and his feet the stripes on his back, the wound on his flesh, the marks on his head has got your name. And he wants to take you home. Who wants to go home while well, we wait patiently on the Lord? I know I do. And I, and as I bet it's going to do a great sermon that will lead it and explore this even more. So happy Sabbath, folks, until I come back. God bless Take care and thank you, Lord, mm-hmm. for your salvation. First of all, I'd like to thank Julie for selecting our song this morning because I, I really do appreciate that. Thank you. And our first song is How Deep the Father's Love for Us. Please join us.
Thank you. Thank you, Laurie and Leo, and everyone else for joining in. It sounded beautiful. <coughs> I'd invite you to uh, kneel if you're able, and we'll spend some time talking with God. Father and Jesus, the Lamb of God, worthy indeed is your name. And we humbly bow before you this morning, Lord, as your created works, though we are sinful and we recognise that. And over this weekend, Lord, as uh, Christian churches around the world celebrate and remember your great love for us, your ultimate sacrifice that you paid on our behalf. We pray that as Anders opens your word this morning and shares with us that uh, his words will be your words and that they will find a resting place in our souls and that they will um, produce, a, produce a harvest and call forth a recommitment of our lives to you, Father, for the great love you have given to us. We thank you that you made us and created us. We thank you that you set aside this Sabbath as a day of rest, 
a day when we can come to remember that you created us, but not only that, that you also saved us. Mm. And for that, Father, we give you thanks. Mm. And as we go through our uh, service time this morning, we pray that your spirit will indeed rest with each of us. We're thinking not only of ourselves here this morning, Lord, but we're thinking of our community and in our community at the moment we have families who are mourning the loss of a loved one. Mm. And we pray that today you will draw near to them, please. And as they uh, make preparations for a funeral tomorrow, we ask, Father, that it will go smoothly and that um, while it will be a time of mourning, that it may be a time of praise and a time of good memories and a time of reassurance, Father, that one day you will come back and you will bring life with you and you will resurrect. Mm. Mm. We pray, Father, that you will help us too, please, to look forward to that day, not as an event, but as a culmination to a relationship with you as we discussed in Sabbath school this morning. So, Father, we um, ask that you will shut us in with your presence and in all that is done and said this morning, it may bring honour and glory to your name, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I'd invite the deacons to come forward, please, to uplift our local offering. Thank you. Just bow our heads. Our Father, we thank you for an opportunity to return to you your tithes and offerings as a token, Lord, of the appreciation we have for the many blessings that you give to us day by day. Father, may we request some rain. We know that uh, things are pretty dry here at the moment, but we know that in your good time you will supply all of our needs. Thank you again for your love to us and your blessings abundantly. In Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to join us now as we sing this lovely old hymn, Tell Me the Story of Jesus.
the children's story this morning. So if the children want to sit along the front, I'll sit here and then the camera can see you and not me. <laughs> it's a plan, isn't it? <laughs> Pastor, can I move your rostrum as well? My story is about pets. Now, just a quick discussion. Hand up if you want to name a pet you have had. Flynn. Duke, our dog. A dog. Seth. Um, um, a parrot named Sue. Oh, exciting, yes. Penny Penny. Right, I thought you'd mention her. A rabbit. A rabbit. Yeah, I think we've had a few pets in our home. We even had a pet mice I think one of the girls wanted a little thing in a cage yeah exciting pets aren't they have any of you had a dog oh you've had Duke did you get Duke as a puppy Flynn no you inherited this great big thing yeah I, I know yes well Richie really thought it was time he had a puppy and he'd been to his friend's house and they had just had a batch of beautiful black terrier puppies. Really, really cute. And he said, Daddy, Mummy, can I get one of those, please? Mm, we'll think about it. And Daddy did have a talk to Mummy and he said, I don't think Richie's responsible enough for a dog. They take a lot of work and you have to care for them. And they thought about it and thought about it. And Richie's birthday was coming up and he was really hoping Mummy and Daddy had made a decision to get a dog, this lovely little cute puppy. You know, this little puppy just stood out to Richie. He had a tongue. His tongue was always hanging out. Mm -hmm. And if, whenever you picked him up, you'd get a lick on your face and he'd kiss you. So Richie had already named him. He was called Kisses because he just loved smooching and licking and touching like that, and Richie really wanted that. Anyway, Daddy said, Mummy, I, maybe it's time. I don't think Richie's responsible enough, though. Maybe it's time. I know what. I will help Richie learn to be responsible. I will write a contract and write all the things he has to do, and Richie will have to sign it. Okay, make a promise. And he did. Richie, come on, have a little chat. We are going to let you have a puppy. And here's the list. These are the things you've got to do. I'm just going to read them out because I won't remember them all. You've got to train the dog to go to the toilet outside. And if he makes a mess inside, you've got to clean it up. Okay? You've got to give the dog a bath once a week. You've got to pay half of the vet bills. Mm. And I want you to pay at least half of the dog food. And the list went on and on and on. And then Daddy said, um, and you will need to sign your name at the bottom to say you are going to do all this. Richie's heart sank. He knew. He would never, never be able to do all those things on that list. And the last thing, do you know what the last thing was on the list? And if Richie cannot do all this, the puppy gets sold and goes away. Can't have him. Ooh. Pup Richie was feeling rather stressed then. And he thought, well, maybe. And then he thought, no, I can't. And he burst into tears and ran to his bedroom and cried and cried and cried himself to sleep. Well, when daddies hear their children crying and mummies listen on too, usually they feel a little bit sad themselves. Excuse me, themselves. And daddy went, oh, I don't like seeing Richie so upset. What am I meant to do? I want him to be responsible. I want him to keep all those, those jobs. He has to learn. What am I going to do? And then he thought, I know what I'm going to do. Hmm. 
The next morning was Richie's birthday. He was so tired because he hadn't slept. He'd lain in his bed all night crying. And then the next day, Daddy went, knock, 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 come on down, Richie. Got something to show you. Guess what it was? It was kisses. The little black terrier that Richie had fallen in love with. And Richie's heart fell because what was the deal? He didn't want to fall in love with a puppy that was going to be taken away. But Daddy said, Richie, I was thinking about this and Mummy and I have realised that you don't have to do those jobs. You do not have to sign your name. I'm going to do those for you. I'm going to take all that away. But if you love Richie enough, I think you will do some of those, but I want you to do it out of love and not because you're scared that you'll lose out. You know, Pastor Anders is talking about Jesus dying and the beautiful gift his father gave us through Jesus. And part of the deal then was, I'm going to cover you for all those things you're never going to be able to be covered for yourself. So that's beautiful, isn't it? The daddy's love, the father's love for us. And it's what Laurie and Leonie sung about, how deep the father's love for us. He just cancelled that out by dying on the cross for us. Okay? Thank you. Bye bye. We need to invite the Soul Brothers up, but feels like coming up. But the Soul Brothers, please, and uh, we'll share an item with you.
And there's a lot of hard acts to follow these days. Last week we had the, the kids' church and all the great little sermons we had lined up last week. Wasn't it amazing? Wasn't that a real blessing? I thank the, the kids' ministry um, leaders and the parents as well. Thank you so much for playing that. And thank you to our kids. It was absolutely amazing and it's a hard act to follow. And that song as well was absolutely beautiful. We're so blessed. So thank you. I hope you all have been blessed this week. Um, we're flying out tomorrow. We, we start in for four weeks. Did I say it right? <laughs> we're on holidays for four weeks, so we're flying out. We're going to miss you guys too. Um, every time we go on holidays, it's always the last couple of weeks, we're like, okay, I'm sick of the Sydney traffic. I'm, I want to come back to the Norfolk um, lack of traffic and come back to you beautiful people here. So we're so blessed. But um, today... We is a special day, and this week has been a special week. I hope you guys were able to come yesterday to the All Saints Chapel or Church. That was a wonderful program as well. And tomorrow we have the dawn service at 6 a.m. at Mount Pitt. If you can make that, come along. Wake up early, come along to that as well. I'll be sharing some um, music there and um, a message as well. Let's open up with a word of prayer before we start. Our Father, we thank you for... Um, we just... We thank you, Lord, for what you did for us 2,000 years ago. Um, we thank you, Lord, for um, the cross. We thank you for Calvary, Lord. We thank you for sending your son. We thank you, Jesus, for being willing to come to save us. Lord, as we open up the word, uh, we pray that um, you would speak to our hearts in this um, almost week of reflection, Lord, of, of what you did for us 2,000 years ago. Lord, as we reflect on you and what you did for us, Lord, um, we pray that you would come into our hearts and dwell in our hearts and be in us, Lord. Bless us as we open up this powerful passage of Scripture. Amen. We're looking at um, this particular powerful, one of the most powerful chapters in the Bible. Um, and... One of the things that I love about the Old Testament, and you probably have, have noticed that in my sermons, is finding Christ in the Old Testament. And there is hundreds of prophecies about Jesus and his life, what he would do on earth, his life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection. I'm looking forward to our youth pastor, Phil, who's going to be sharing another powerful, another powerful chapter in the Old Testament in the coming weeks. I'm looking forward to that. Um, but there are so many prophecies of Jesus in the Old Testament, so many stories, so many symbols, so many shadows, so many types in the Old Testament that you just, it blows your mind, doesn't it? And, and we've touched on some of these. We've looked at the story of Abraham. But this particular passage in Scripture, this particular chapter, um, was written 700 years before Christ was born on earth. And so we want to look at Isaiah 53. We want to see the gospel. How is, how is the gospel portrayed in these verses? We want to see what does the death of Jesus mean to us. We want to see what does the humanity of Christ, what does that mean for us? And so we're going to go and, and take this, pick this verse apart, um, verse, verse by verse, in Isaiah chapter 53, Isaiah 53, and we will beginning in beginning in, in verse in verse one. And, and as we're going through this passage, just just tell me who on earth could this apply to besides Christ? So just have a look at it word for word. You, you look at all these key words in this passage. Who could that apply to? Who on earth other than Christ could this passage apply to? And it's a real faith-building exercise. When you do a Bible study, I want to encourage you, we're not going to be going through all of um, the passage in the New Testament, but you just, you just you, you get the New Testament, get the passages, read, the old, read this passage, and you're just seeing link after link after connection after connection after connection. And I mean, count how many you can find. Count how many you can find. Verse 1. Who has believed our report? 
And to whom has the Lord, has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he, verse 2, shall grow up before him as a tender plant. And as a root out of dry ground, he has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So he'll grow up as a tender plant, grow up on planet Earth, born in a manger, grew up in the little country town of, of Nazareth, grew up as, a, as, a, as almost as a root out of dry ground, born, grown up, growing up. And this is interesting. Has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. And probably some of you have seen some of the movies of Christ and um, shows of Christ. There's been many. And they portray him as quite a Hollywood, quite a good-looking bloke. <laughs> Don't they? Lush brown hair, nice beard, you know. Nice eyes and symmetrical face. But here it shows he's prob, probably, well, there's nothing attractive, it seems, here about Christ. Nothing that really drew people to his looks. It says in um, verse 3, he is despised and rejected by men. When he came to earth, we know that Constantly, right? He was constantly rejected, constantly despised by his own family, even by his own family, betrayed by his own countrymen, by his own town. Not betrayed, but you know, despised, rejected by his, by even his own town. Um, his his Jewish people, the religious leaders, and you know what? Even by his own disciples. Um, even by his own disciples, betrayed, but also rejected and, and well, they ran away in his time of need, in his time of hour. It says he is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He was familiar with everything that we go through, and I mean everything. Everything that we have been through, we have gone through, are going through at the moment and will go through, he's been through it. He's been through the hardships, he's experienced the pain, the sadness, the sorrow, the hurt, the emotional hurt, the betrayal, the tears. We think of the tears that he shed, the loss, the anguish, temptation. You know, in, in Hebrews 4, it says we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. He's seen, he's held, he's had, had human, he's been garbed in human flesh, fully human, fully God. He's experienced what it means to be human. He, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted. He's experienced temptation to the highest degree, wouldn't you say, in his life? On the road to his death, imagine all the temptations the devil was throwing at him then, hurling at him when the, knee, the, the nails were piercing his hands. And these, these are not some nails you get from Bunnings, right, or from Christian Bailey Agency. The, we had we had one archaeologist come in when I was studying theology, and he showed us the literal nails that were going through people who were being crucified. And these weren't the thin little nails that that Laurie builds. These are these are thick nails. Can you can imagine that grinding through your bones. Can you imagine that grinding through here, and you you you're stepping up to to you pull yourself up on the cross. So you, you dive of asphyxiation. You pull yourself up, and you you can't breathe right because you're hanging there. And you, you try to pull yourself up and you think, how are you going to pull yourself up when what's going to happen there? You've got these, these nails, thick, thick as can be, grinding against your bones. Imagine, imagine what would be going through Christ's mind at this time. Imagine the temptations a devil would have been hurling at Christ, going through this excruciating pain. His disciples have forsaken him. 
his very countrymen had forsaken, the very people he came to save. The, 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 the Roman soldiers were beating him and spitting him and mocking him, putting crown of, of thorns on his, on his brow and, and being spat upon, beard torn. And you, you, you know, you, you've, you've probably seen the shows, you've probably read this before. Can you imagine the temptation that the devil was hurling at Christ at his darkest, very darkest hour? At the same time, the sins were crushing him. The penalty of our sins were crushing him at the same time. Imagine all this going on. He certainly can sympathize, and empathize with us in our weaknesses, dear friends, can he? Because of the temptations that he himself was at all points tempted as, he, as we are, yet without sin. And, and it goes on, let us therefore come boldly. Let us therefore come timidly. Let us therefore come shyly in our prayer. Let us only come at 7.30 in the morning at a certain point of the day. Let us only come at night time before we go to sleep. Let us come therefore boldly before the throne of mercy, throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When you feel tempted, dear friend, Come to Jesus, who endured all temptation, and he will give you mercy and grace to help in time of need. Verse 5, it says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. And these stripes, dear friends, they were, and we talk about the physical pain. They, they literally put these poor criminals on the verge of death, hanging between life and death with every whip. But his, the penalty for sin was put upon him. He took our penalty of death. He took our sins. And as he hung there on the cross, he experienced our judgment on sin. Because what, what does the Bible say? The wages of sin is death. And why is that? Well, God has a law in this universe. God's law of love as seen more further defined in the Ten Commandments. And when we sin, we become separated from God. And like a little fire, a little coal that is taken out of your fireplace or when, on your pathfinder camps or like a little coal of fire that is taken out of the, the big fire and eventually, what does it do? You take it out of the big fire, it, 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 it dies out. We are separated because of our sin, separated from the, the life of God. We are separated because of our sin. Our sin separate us from God. And Jesus, he took that everlasting separation when he was there on the cross. And as the judgment of God upon our sins were placed on his shoulders, life was being crushed out. He was experiencing the everlasting separation from the Father. And yes, he laid down his life as well. We know he laid down his life, but he experienced that judgment of sin. Can you imagine that? The sin of all of us in this room, the sins from our past, the sins from our present, the sins in our future, the sins from the people of old, the sins of people that will be born, all placed on the shoulders and on, on Christ. And he was dying that spiritual death. He was, being, he was being crushed out and he also laid down his life for us and he gave up his life. He gave up his life for us. Because let's face it, there'd be no hope for us. Absolutely no hope for us. And it says, by his stripes we are healed. Verse 6, all we, speaking about us now, all we have gone astray. And we have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord, so we, it says, we, we, pretty much we have turned, we have rebelled. It doesn't help that we have a sinful nature either. That puts an extra spanner in the works. 
sinful nature that we have. But it says, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I love this. There's a, there's a great Christian author named Timothy Keller. He's a, he's a, got some really, really insightful, really amazing books he has and talks a lot about the gospel. I read one quote this week on Instagram. I follow his, he actually passed away about six, six, eight months ago. Um, really, really good books, really great books. Not, he's not Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, I'm not sure what he is, but great books. And um, um, even before he died, um, he had cancer and he was, you know, going through all the chemotherapy and all that sort of thing. And he, he, he knew his time was, his time was coming, and, and, um, but he held on to his faith. And he said, I'm ready to see my Lord. You know, obviously, they don't, they don't believe in um, you know what we believe is SDAs with um, we believe that we'll be raised when Christ comes but he said I'm ready to see my Lord and he had this to say he said I am so bad that he had to die I am so loved that he was glad to die isn't that profound I'll say that again I am so bad that he had to die. I am so loved that he was glad to die. That's powerful. That's so true, isn't it? Verse 7, he, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. You, you're probably seeing all these prophecies fulfilled, right? Aren't you? You're thinking all these instances in the New Testament. Wow, it's, we, we see this in the New Testament. This is 700 years before Christ was born. We're seeing evidence as, as sister here. Eliza was saying, we see the evidence. He was, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. That's hard sometimes, isn't it? We think of our Christian experience. And we're being oppressed and we're being whatever. It's hard not to open your mouth at Christ. You know what? We can see a great example in Jesus sometimes, eh? That we need in our, in our, with our words. He, he was oppressed and literally oppressed, physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally oppressed. And he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. What a lesson for me. What a lesson for me in my walk, eh? Just to keep my mouth shut sometimes. It's a good lesson. Very good lesson. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shear is silent, so he opened not his mouth. John the Baptist said, But all oh, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world, when he's just about to baptize the Son of God, the Son of Man, Jesus. Verse 8, he was taken from prison, from judgment. He was certainly taken from judgment to judgment in the judgment hall of, of Pilate and, and to Herod and, and um, Caiaphas. All these judgments that were happening, we could see that, right? We see that in New Testament. All these fulfill, all these fulfillments. Who will declare his generation? Verse eight: For he was cut off from the land of the living. That very word will be used in I know the in Phil's sermon as well, and in Daniel nine. That very word, cut off. You're gonna love that message. You got to be here for that. It's a powerful message in Daniel chapter nine. And they made his grave with the wicked. Was his grave made with the wicked? Well, we're all wicked. We're all sinful. And the graves were surrounding in, um, in that time where he was buried. On that seventh day when he was in the tomb. And it says, verse 9, But with the rich at his death. How was that fulfilled? He was given a rich man's tomb. Joseph of Arimathea. Because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. We know he, was, he had no sin, no deceit, no guile in his mouth. He was innocent. In verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. That, that word there, I love, has, there's another word in another translation that has pierced. Yet it pleased the Lord to pierce him. Was he pierced? I believe he was. He was pierced. Wow, it's amazing, isn't it? Isn't the Bible amazing? 700 years before, we're seeing all these prophecies fulfilled. We're seeing these prophetic, these messianic prophecies lining up. Despised, rejected, was he? 
Rich man's tomb, was it? Pierced. Made a sin offering. Opened not his mouth. We see that. Verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, to pierce him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin. It didn't please the father to offer his son. But I don't think that's what it's saying here. I think what it's saying is in the grand scheme of salvation history, in the grand scheme of things, it pleased the Father that there was a way out for us. That's what pleased the Father. I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's seeing his son being killed on a cross. I don't think it's that at all. It, it, in the grand scheme of eternity, it pleased the Father that you and I can have a chance. That's what pleased him and that he will see us one day with him in heaven, in his kingdom. That's what pleased. That's what pleased the Father, I believe, here. And it says, when you shall make his soul an offering for sin. We think of all the offerings in Leviticus and Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, all the offerings for sin. Christ was the ultimate offering for sin to save us. And it says, he shall see the, the Messiah, the suffering servant, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his, in his hand. He was seeing the resurrection. We're seeing the resurrection here. He shall prolong his days. He will have life. This will not be the end. He shall see his seed. What does that mean? He shall see you. He will see you. He will see us. God forbid that we die in this life before Christ comes. He will see you. He knows he will see you. He will see you there. He will see the fruit of his labors. He will see you in the kingdom. He'll be, he'll be risen again. He, his days will pre, be prolonged into eternity. And he will see you. He will see you, his seed. The fruit of his labor. He will see you. Verse 11, he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge. Did Christ impart a lot of knowledge to us? Did he? He imparted a lot of knowledge, a lot of salvational knowledge. You think of our, the famous John 3.16, the verse that has saved countless millions in the world throughout history. Has it? Countless millions. By his knowledge, my servant shall... My righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Verse 12, uh, the father says, this is the father saying of Jesus. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul under death. And he was numbered with the transgressors and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And dear friends, Jesus is in heaven right now. He is in the sanctuary in heaven and he's making intercession for us. He's making intercession for us in the judgment. When your name comes up in the books, when your name comes up, Jesus is there in heaven and he's saying, Dear Colleen, I died for her and she accepted me. And I stand between her. So when the father sees Colleen, he doesn't see Colleen, he sees Jesus' perfect record. He stands in intercession for us. Jesus is still working for us, dear friends in heaven. He is in intercession for the transgressors, intercession for us. I want to invite dear sister Lot to come up and sing this beautiful song to rescue a sinner like me. And as she sings this song, dear friends, I want you to reflect on the cross. I want you to reflect on what we've read, reflect on the words. I want to invite her up to come and sing.
5.8, it says, But God commended His love toward us, in that while we, where we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Indeed, rescued a sinner like us, dear friends. And amen to that. Thank you, dear sister, for sharing that beautiful song and that gift, your gift with us today. He rescued a sinner like you, dear friend, like me. He, we are so bad that he had to die for us, but we're so loved that he was glad to do it. And I wonder, dear friend, if you want to receive Jesus wholeheartedly in your heart today. Will you raise your hand and say, Lord, you came and rescued a sinner like me. I want to receive you into my heart, into my life. The second thing I want to ask, will you give your life to Jesus? Will you give your life to Jesus today? Will you follow him? Will you take the name Christ? In your life, dear friend, we allow him to rescue you because we can't do it ourselves. We can't do it ourselves. We are in a hopeless condition. We need a rescue, and that is Jesus. Will you let him rescue you today? Will you give your life to Jesus today? We're going to stand and sing our final song.
our Lord Jesus, Lord, our, our suffering, the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. We're in awe of what we find in your word there, Lord, of how you predicted before you came, that we've seen it fulfilled. What a wonderful, what a wonderful word that you've given us, a powerful divine word you've given us, Lord. We put our trust in it today. We put our trust in your word, Lord. We put our trust in you, Lord Jesus. You endured the cross, suffered the shame, and rose again for us on that third day. We put our trust in you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord, and we worship you. And we accept. Lord, maybe someone here, it's the first time they've accepted you in their hearts. Lord, we want to tell you, Lord, we want to ask you that you come into our lives. But Lord, also this morning, we want to tell you, we want to commit our lives to you. We thank you, Lord, once again. We love you. Amen.